So now that we have an idea of kind of what the nested logit model is and why we might prefer it to the logit model, uh, those, those kind of more flexible substitution patterns and elasticities that might more realistically represent uh, you know, the kinds of ways that, that real consumers or, or other agents would uh, substitute between, between alternatives. Uh, let's now talk about how we're gonna actually estimate this model and some of the other things we wanna keep in mind as we're thinking about actually uh, applying the nested logit model. So first of all, estimation. Estimation of the nested logit model is, is very similar to the logit model. We have those more complex choice probabilities that we're gonna have to deal with. If we remember back to the, uh, the last video, the, the choice probabilities were, you know, had, a, had a, more pieces to them. But ultimately we're gonna be able to use those choice probabilities in exactly the same way that we used logit choice probabilities. We're gonna use maximum likelihood and we're gonna find the set of parameters that make it most likely for us to, uh, you know, or find the set of parameters that make it most likely to have generated the choices that we actually observe. So kind of the, uh, kind of the, the set of steps we wanna go through are exactly the same set of steps we talked about a couple of weeks ago with logit estimation. It's just that when we calculate choice probabilities, those choice probabilities are uh, kind of more, more complex and take some more calculation. But kind of conceptually, the estimation procedure we're doing is exactly the same thing. There's one caveat here, which is that when we introduce these nests, when we introduce the kind of exponents into our, uh, uh, into our log likelihood function or into our choice probabilities, now our log likelihood function is no longer globally concave. And so numerical optimization might be more difficult it's going to be easier to kind of get stuck at local maxima instead of finding global maxima and those kinds of issues that we talked about uh, but didn't encounter yet. Those are going to crop up here or pop up here that we might not have had to deal with in the past. I also just want to point out we talked through that two step procedure, which uh, to of thinking about the first step as a logit model of nests, and then the second step is a logit model of alternatives within that nest. Um, I think that's a great way to conceptualize the nested logit model, but we don't actually want to estimate it that way. Our standard errors or our, our variance estimator is going to be wrong if we actually estimate this as kind of a sequential two step uh, estimation procedure. We're going to have to do something like bootstrapping to get the correct variance estimator. So, um, and, and there might be actually some other empirical problems that pop up when we try to do it as a sequential two step model. So, just use those total choice probabilities. Think about it as one big, you know, just kind of one big step instead of the two smaller steps when you actually do the estimation. Um, also, you know, we're not going to have to necessarily hand code this by ourselves. Uh, it might be uh, kind of instructive to do so, but mlogit has the ability to do it for us. So we're going to see how to do this in class this week, but. With the mlogit function, it can take a nests argument where we can tell it what our nesting structure is, and it can, uh, impo you know, calculate these new choice probabilities based on those nests. Calculate the or estimate the nest parameters that we need. All of that stuff, it can do that for us. Uh, so that'll be really handy uh, to, to to just let mlogit handle the more kind of complicated math here instead of having to do it ourselves. All right, another thing that you might uh, run across as you are actually trying to estimate a nested logit model is a lot of times you'll see a, a, both the logit and the nested logit model estimated using market level data. Kind of everything we described so far is assuming that you have kind of micro or individual level data, but sometimes you just have market level data. So a classic example of this is that you observe the price, market share, and attributes of every cereal brand at the grocery store, and you want to estimate the structural parameters of the consumer decision making that explain those purchases. You want to understand how are consumers choosing among these hundreds of different cereals out there. Well, when you think about taking choice probabilities and aggregating them up over many consumers facing the same kind of choice setting, so you have hundreds of people going into the grocery store and going into the cereal aisle every day, 
every one of those people is going to have a choice probability. If we kind of think about adding those up over all of the consumers, what we end up with are actually market shares. So if our choice probability say that people have a 20% chance of choosing cereal X, kind of by the law of large numbers, if we observe enough people making this choice, then we should see 20 people, 20% 20 of, of shoppers buying that particular cereal. And so if we have this market level data where we're kind of already aggregated over many consumers facing the same choices, the same alternatives and attributes, then we can think about instead of our, uh, you know, having this expression for choice probabilities, we have this expression for market shares. This is very common in the IO literature to see something more like this with market shares instead of individual choice probabilities. Well, if we assume that representative utility is linear, then we can do some math with this uh, market share expression and end up with this expression here where the difference of the logs of market shares are going to be a linear function of our attributes and of our, uh, our these kind of conditional, uh, conditional market shares, as well as all the parameters that we want to estimate. And so one thing we can do is if we set one alternative to be a reference in its own nest, we normally think about this being the outside option, which is just not purchasing any cereal at all. But we have to pick one to be our its own separate nest that's going to be like the reference that we compare everything to. Then this expression can be simplified to the one here at the bottom of the slide. And it turns out this is going to be an expression that we can solve just using an OLS linear regression. We have to calculate the value that goes on the left-hand side here, but we know all of these Xs. If we know this conditional market share, which should, once again, if we have data on market shares, all of these things are just things we can calculate. Then we can just estimate these parameters that we want. So sometimes we're gonna have market level data and we're gonna actually be able to use a simpler estimation procedure to get the exact same parameters that we want. Um, and that's just by virtue of the fact that we can think about market shares as being, as being choice probabilities. We also might run into a situation where we have panel data. So kind of the last scenario was we have less data. We don't have micro data, we have aggregated data. Now we're saying we have even more data. We don't just have a cross section of data, but we have a whole panel where we observe decision makers making choices many times, multiple times, multiple different time periods where we observe these choices. And so if we observe a panel data set for, for a discrete choice problem, uh, in this case, it, we can just simply add a time dimension to our, our random utility model and to our choice probabilities, and everything works just the same. We're just going to be thinking about not just having a, a, a choice probability for a decision maker for a particular alternative, but it will also be for a particular point in time. And the thought here is that if the attributes are changing over time, then they might make different choices at different periods of time. And so as those attributes change, we might end up with different probabilities today versus tomorrow versus the next day. Uh, whether I choose to bike to work or not is gonna depend on whether it's raining today or not, for example. And so uh, we talked about this with the logit model. It's exactly the same here. We can estimate this model just as we did in the cross section. It's just that now we're gonna have kind of this pooled model where we think of every decision maker in each time period as its own observation. Uh, we can include things like lagged or future variables to capture the dynamics here. So if what you do today depends on what you do yesterday, we can put that choice, we can put yesterday's choice into today's model, uh, which is kind of the second point also. We can include previous choices as explanatory variables to represent things like habit formation. We could also represent variables from yesterday. So, you know, maybe... You don't know what the gas price is today, but you knew what the gas price was a week ago when you last drove past the gas station. And so that's kind of what you have in your mind as the current gas price when you're thinking about, uh, you know, kind of how costly it would be to, to take a trip or to, to, to drive to work or something like that. 
The one issue here is that the IID assumption still has to hold across decision makers and across time periods. The nested logit model relaxes that IID assumption for alternatives within the same nest, but it is still treating each individual observation as being IID. But of course, the kind of unobserved characteristics of a decision maker that are going to affect their choices, those are unlikely to be independent over time. If you have a preference for driving to work today, you're going to have a preference for driving to work tomorrow. But the nested logit model with panel data is going to assume that each one of those decisions that you make every day, that those are independent of one another. And that's not likely to hold. And so uh, unless you think you're in a setting where that IID over decision makers and time periods is going to hold, you might want to use uh, a, a more, an even more flexible model like the mixed logit model that we'll talk about next week. All right, so that's it on the nested logit model. Now in the last video, we are going to talk about, just give a brief overview of some of the other models that we can describe as being uh, generalized extreme value models that are similar to the nested logit model.